Hey everybody, I'm back again to talk about our chapter on World War II. Um, I've been reading a lot, studying a lot, learning a lot more about World War II recently and trying out some of these new ideas on my classes. Um, wish me luck, we'll see if I can get this done in 10 minutes or less. Um, so the first thing that I want to mention and that I uh, said in the my intro to your discussion on the chapter narrative is that we have to remember World War II as a continuation of that great global conflict in two parts, World War I and World War II, that must chiefly be understood as uh, a conflict over empire. Remember that the biggest land-based empires, they dissolved at the end or were dismembered at the end of World War I because they lost that conflict. Um, the German Empire, the Ottoman Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and certainly the Russian Empire, which transformed into the Soviet Union. Um, the, there were other empires that survived World War I. Of course, the, the British being the, the primary one, the French, Dutch, um, the American, the Japanese, uh, these primarily maritime empires, they, they made it through World War I, and in some ways, were stronger, certainly in the American case, uh, were stronger after World War I. The League of Nations, Woodrow Wilson's brainchild um, to bring peace and a, a basic sense of international order to the world uh, after the Great War. Uh, it was formed and had some success in that 20-year interval between the end of the First World War and the Second. Um, but some n n notable shortcomings. One uh, is who, who, who was excluded. Um, Germany, which was pinned with the blame for World War I, was excluded. The Soviet Union, which nobody wanted to deal with because it was the this first communist country in the world uh, was excluded and then also who who could have joined but did not namely the United States right uh, the US president had conceived of the League of Nations but because of partisan stuff that you read about a, a couple chapters ago uh, the United States didn't actually actually join this international peacekeeping body all right um, so as the, the remaining empires and the vanquished powers sort of reconstituted themselves uh, over, over 20 years, uh, it, including, of course, the advent of the Great Depression, uh, there's you know, a reshuffling of power and interests. And uh, World War II emerges as really, it, it's really two conflicts uh, that merge into one. Uh, there's the... Pacific side or the Asia Pacific theater of this conflict and that has mostly to do with the fact that Japan um, a rising industrial power and maritime time empire is is increasing its reach um, and uh, including with the League of Nations giving it control after World War one over the former German colonies in uh, Micronesia and the Marshall Islands, which put uh, Japanese control right in between Hawaii and the Philippines, right? So put the United States and, and Japan on a collision course. In particular, Japan is very, very interested in gaining access to more uh, oil and coal and rubber uh, resources, which are to its south in lands that are controlled by the Dutch and the British Empire as well as the Philippines controlled by the United States. All right, so that's one conflict and you kind of know how that comes to a head uh, with the Japanese gambit to, uh, to eliminate the US Pacific fleet that was stationed at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, all at once. They, they were close, but they didn't quite destroy the US Pacific fleet. And so that opens up the, 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 the Asia Pacific theater of World War II. Then on the other side of Eurasia, there's Germany rearming itself under the, under the dictatorship of Adolf Hitler. Hitler is a special case. Um, we, you know, just in our you know, general cultural memory, we know Hitler was a, 
racist and genocidal and we remember the Holocaust. Um, I'm very, very thankful to, uh, to Tim Snyder, who I've already introduced you to via video. Uh, this book that I just finished recently, Black Earth, The Holocaust as History and Warning, has really revolutionized my thinking about Hitler understanding better um, his thought and how the Holocaust happened. Um, the way that the European part of World War II is also an imperial war is that Hitler um, aimed to make Germany into a new imperial power. Um, its colonies in the Pacific and in Africa were gone, but what was left? What was left was looking to the east, looking to the rich, black, fertile soil of Ukraine, which was then part of the Soviet Union. Um, so Hitler's idea was to expand, to make a new German empire so that Germany could remain an industrial power and could have uh, ample sources of agricultural produce through this new land empire in Ukraine and on to Central Asia. The only problem, of course, was like the Soviet Union and the states in between Germany and the Soviet Union, uh, namely Poland, right? Um, so, so Hitler's objective really had nothing to do with France and Britain. It wasn't about Western Europe. That was all just needing to neutralize those countries so that he could be free to attack the Soviet Union, which he assumed would collapse quickly <clears throat> because in Hitler's mind, the Soviet Union was not a real state. It was an artificial construction, a conspiracy by the Jews. And here's how the Holocaust fits in here. We think of Hitler as racist, but it, it, this is really a special, a special case. Um, so on the one hand, Hitler did believe that the world was, that, that, that human society was, can, could, was chiefly racial struggle. Right? That's how you understand uh, human history is the struggle of races against each other. In Hitler, this is, you know, a, a horrible, logical extension of the idea of social Darwinism that we talked about earlier, right? Um, so races compete for food and for resources. Hitler re remembered very well starvation in Germany during the Great War. Uh, the German people had to rearm themselves, had to be strong, and had to take the resources that they needed. Those resources happened to be under the control of the Soviet Union. The peoples who lived there, the Slavic peoples, they were racial inferiors. And once the Germans got there, they would be able to take over, enslave the Ukrainians and other Slavic peoples, and have them work and raise their food, and all would be well, right? The problem was that Jews were a special case. They were not racially inferior. They were almost like, like supermen, right? The Jews, in Hitler's mind, were responsible for these nefarious ideas that made human beings think of each other in, as human beings as opposed to races. Ideas like science, liberalism, communism, socialism, Christianity, all of these things that enabled human beings to think of themselves and others as individual, individual human beings as opposed to members of competing races, all of that was the responsibility of Jews. So Jews had to be neutralized and Jews had to be removed. The origin of the Holocaust as it unfolded is that the vast majority of the Jews in the world lived in the lands between Germany and where Hitler saw Germany's new empire should be. They lived in Poland, Belarus, the Baltic states, and Ukraine. When Germany came into possession of these lands, the massacre of the Jewish population in particular began.
it was then at the same time a war of genocide and a war of empire and colonization at the same time. The model that Hitler used, it's in Mein Kampf. Uh, one of the things that hit Timothy Snyder does in Black Earth is start out reviewing Hitler's writing so that we understand the logic. The model that Hitler used for this new German Empire, you know, where would you see in the world another Germanic people, another Euro uh, Northern European people who had conquered a continent, um, eliminated the racially inferior people that lived there before, and enslaved another group to do their agricultural labor for them? He said, Germany had to do this in Ukraine so that it could have as high a standard of living as the Euro-Americans had achieved through the same means. It's a real tough pill to swallow, but it also helps us to understand how World War II and the confrontation with Hitler's unique racial ideology it provided the impetus for the United States to more energetically than before confront its own racial ideology. Does that make sense? We're the good guys. We can't be like that. In fact, pay attention to your primary documents for this chapter. I'm, I'm going a little bit over 10 minutes, but I hope y'all will think this is worth it. So the two primary documents that I want you to focus on for this chapter um, have to do with African-American visions of the war, right? And one of them is a visual document that is very much about that contrast between the United States and the Nazis, right? Or, or maybe not so much contrast in point of fact. So what is the author of that poster doing um, in trying to make a connection between Nazi racial ideology and the Jim Crow system in the United States. So, so think that through. And then the other one is from, uh, from a, a, an essay by Charles Wesley, who's a, a historian, um, who was asked to write about what, what the Negro wants out of World War II. And he said very clearly that African Americans are looking at the war in, 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 in two dimensions, right? The transformation that's required at home and abroad. That we African Americans are fighting World War II not to take things back to the status quo as it was before, but we're fighting for a new world at home and abroad, a world that's going to be free of racism and of empire, and Wesley seems to say that these two things, racism and empire, are, are closely connected to each other. And that American democracy, the survival of Amer American democracy, requires that both of them, at home and abroad, be, be removed, right? Um, put that in, in context as well with the other visions of, of post-war order uh, that come up in this chapter. Uh, particularly um, look at uh, Henry Wallace and, um, uh, and FDR's Economic Bill of Rights. So basically, you know, uh, making the New Deal permanent and extending it to the whole world. Uh, remember that uh, World War I was kind of the high point of the progressive movement. Um, in a sense, World War II is about, you know, is about making the New Deal bigger and better and, and, and permanent. And then there's another uh, sort of post-war vision that also says, yes, the United States is going to be uh, in charge of a, a, new, a new world order, uh, but this is you know, the one that's, that's articulated by Henry Luce and uh, Friedrich Hayek, um, where American big business is really in the driver's seat. So prosperity for all, 
but uh, but who who's who's in charge right um so those are 15 minutes those are some thoughts that i hope will help you think through uh, world war ii connecting it both to the new deal and the 20s and world war one um, connecting it to the cold war that is going to emerge even before world war ii is over and, and through it all uh, this theme that we've been discussing about empire hierarchy um the, the tension between hierarchy and equality empire and democracy uh, we see it all in world war ii the last thing i need to say i'm sorry this is so long um, i want to just say a word about your film um, this is part of a, a a series about world war ii that is produced by the same the same guy ken burns who did the national parks so great filmmaker uh, this is one episode that focuses on like 1943 and 4 um and the 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 idea behind this this multi-part series is that it focuses on four towns in the united states uh, mobile alabama luverne minnesota waterbury connecticut and um sacramento california and it follows primarily individuals from those towns and what happens in those areas at home. How does World War II transform these places uh, at, at domestically, right? But also um, people from those towns, you know, where do they go in the world as a part of fighting this, this great conflict, right? Uh, and, and so you can see sort of the transformations inside the United States and follow the progress of what's happening internationally um, at the same time, through the prism of these four four towns in different parts of the country. It's a great way of holding this huge, huge conflict together. Um, I hope you'll see that many of these same themes are showing up in, in the film as well. Race, racial conflict within the United States, um, the transformation of the economy in order to fight World War II, um, as well as looking at uh, part of the European theater, and the Pacific Theater. Oh my gosh, it's a great film. It's violent and nasty, and there's some humorous parts, uh, and, and, and it's really touching, and, and I, I hope you get a lot out of it. Um, I say, turn your speakers up loud, because that's the way war was. I'm sorry this went so long. I did my best. Bye.